Well, good morning, church. Good morning. It is um, really good to be with you this morning and um, worship with you. Uh, I've missed you. Uh, weather didn't cooperate a couple weeks ago. Last week, I uh, had the um, amazing uh, good fortune of spending most of the week uh, up in Grand Rapids, Michigan at a worship and preaching conference and um, it is so good to be up there uh, to see what God is doing outside of our walls and outside of our community and to get a larger picture of what is going on. And so uh, this year was extra special. It's always been a good time. This is my fifth time up there, but Julie got to take some days off of work and tag along with me. And so she sat in the meetings with me and we had things to discuss in the evening then and um, I'm always amazed at when I go there the uh, vibrancy of the church and um, it's always a good reminder to me of what God is doing in our world and so they come back all charged up and ready to go um, it is good to see Carol Leonard here with us, um, worshiping with us today. Uh, she, Carol's had a, a tough couple of weeks, but she is here, and it is amazing how God has helped her through this time and, and to see her so resilient. And Good to have you worshiping with us, Carol. Um, good to have Jan Baker back with us. We haven't seen her for a while, and uh, she said she's finally able to get out and about again uh, because of her circumstances. So. Good to have you. Sue Richardson, it's good to see you. I, I wouldn't know why you're here. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe something to do with us up in front. We're glad to have Matt here with us this morning to do some special music as well. We have a lot of things to do today. Um, and uh, one of the things that we will be doing as I see Kevin walk in the door is this will be Kevin and Carrie's last official Sunday with us. And so we will be sending them off uh, with prayer today as they embark on a new chapter in their lives. And so we want to uh, do that as well as some of the other things with our congregational meeting, which will not take very long today. I want to make one announcement to you before we begin our worship service. And that is uh, the fourth lying down in your announcement thing. Uh, Deb, this year, in the directory, wishes to publish everyone's cell phone numbers. In addition, if you have a landline, it would be in there, but also your cell phones, all right? If she has that information, she would like to publish that. If you have a problem with that, you need to contact the office, all right, so that she doesn't do that. She's not gonna call each one of you to ask your permission. She assumes she has it unless she hears from you, okay? We're trying, we're trying to help get communication out, okay? Um, we live in a world in which communication is really easy uh, if we're all technologically savvy, and we're, unfortunately we are not as a congregation, so we need as many uh, means to get to people as we can, so uh, please take note of that. Are there any other things that need to be uh, shared with the congregation today other than the fact that after the service, there is a potluck downstairs. And even if you didn't bring anything, I assure you there is plenty down there. I was down there earlier. There's an amazing amount of food down there. Please join us for a time of fellowship and, uh, and, and a meal together and uh, let us enjoy one another's company. Anything else? All right, let's take a moment, dedicate our hearts and our minds to this space. Just a quiet moment to quiet your heart and to take everything from the week and set it back and everything that's going to be happening this coming week and keep it out and just for the moment uh, center up on the things of God and uh, maybe offer a prayer to God. There is one in your bulletin if you would like to use that.
Amen. Join me in our call to worship. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. See, darkness covers the earth, and thick darkness is over the peoples. But the Lord rises upon you, and his glory has appeared to all the earth with the birth of the sun. All of you who would praise him, prepare your hearts to offer your worship. All of you who would find him, Prepare your souls to seek him out. And all of you who would listen to him, prepare your minds to encounter truth. Praise God for the gift of the Son. Let us lift up our many voices and praise the God of all people.
may be seated. As you came in this morning, did everyone get a copy of the annual meeting agenda? Does anyone not have one? I've been informed by the clerk that we have sufficient numbers here to declare a, for a quorum. We have already offered our pr prayers and we will open our service as we opened our service with that. I would ask you to take, if you would, just a minute or so on the page behind the agenda and look at the minutes from last year. I always think it's fun to have to approve those because most of us don't even remember there was a last year, let alone what all went on in that. But our clerks do a great job of reporting all of that. So those minutes are before you. We had a lot of stuff going on last year. We had to change some bylaw stuff and some operation stuff and all kinds of things, and that all went on. So as you look that over, could I have a motion from the floor to approve those minutes and receive them? Anyone? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All right, it's been moved and seconded. Is there further discussion on that? All those in favor say aye. aye. Anybody opposed? All right, I would call on, on uh, Ben Reese to present to us uh, the results of the nominating committee, first of all, with the session. Okay, so the nominating committee has placed before us Dan Badenhop and Olga Hall for the position of being elders in the church. Are there any additional nominations from the floor? Okay, and the nominating committee has also placed before us. Okay, so the nominating committee is placing before us Connie Cobb, Terry Snyder, and John Yarnell to be the members of next year's nominating committee or 2019's nominating committee. Are there any other nominations from the floor? I declare the nominations closed. All those in favor of these officers to be elected say aye. aye. Opposed? That is done. In the necrology report, there were four important people to our congregation who passed away in 2018. Wilson Stowe, Richard Cobb, Barb Zarin, and June Morgan. These are very important people. Their lives are dearly missed by many of us in the church and especially by those most connected to them. What I'm gonna ask us to do this year is a little different. In the past, we've had a prayer for these and remember them and called remembrance of all of those who have been with us in the past and, and who have gone on to their heavenly home. What I'm asking you to do this year is on the Sunday of Memorial Day, the Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, that, that weekend, we will have a special service and that service will be a service acknowledging these four and all of those who we have lost. All right, so we're using the memorial concept for our church. And we are saying in that service, we will have a very special service. It will be all about that. We will be remembering those who have gone before us. And we will be allowed to have time just to reflect and be gracious. We'll do some activities with that. And we will pray and offer our prayers to God. It will be a, a, the focus of the service will be that. Um, thing and I think um, that could become a tradition that we visit in the future depending on how it goes uh, I've never designed a service like that but many churches are going to that and I'm hoping to learn some things so today what we, what we will do is we will just have a brief prayer and then we will have a, a more uh, formal time and that would have impact everyone here who has lost someone everyone here who has had to say goodbye and that service will be a time of remembrance for that. So let's just take a moment now and let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for those who have gone before us, those who have finished their race, who have received their reward, and who now await the resurrection. We especially remember Wilson Stowe, Richard Cobb, Barb Zarin, and June Morgan. We thank you for their lives and what they have meant to us. We thank you that the hope of eternal life now is with them. We offer these things to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am looking forward to that service. I've already got ideas rolling around on that, and um, I believe that will be a very powerful service for us. I want you to look through some of the annual reports. You'll have a report from the clerk of session on page three, uh, the congregational life team, uh, the operations team, uh, giving you ideas of what they have done and accomplished, finance and stewardship, the heritage, education, chancel choir, precious moments. All of those reports are in there. The report from the pastor is in there. Also, if you go to page nine, there is a report on where the church finances stand. You'll have a, that is a balance sheet showing you the church uh, uh, cash accounts and the um, properties and the total value of those. And if you'll flip the page to page 11, you will see the proposed budget that has been approved by session. A congregation does not have to approve that. Uh, that is something that is done by session, and you will see that our uh, budget for this year is slightly less than what it has been in the past, uh, but our, uh, we have been able to uh, manage the finances of the church in such a way that even as our numbers have dwindled some, uh, our, our church has remained healthy in a financial sense. And so Session has done an amazing job with that. So all those reports are yours to take home and to read and to study uh, meticulously. Um, I'm sure you will. They are not to be read during the sermon. Okay? I'm going to ask you that we would take this morning and we would use the benediction at the end of the service as our time uh, for official adjournment. Do I have somebody that would uh, uh, approve that motion? Is there a second to that? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. That is our congregational meeting for this year. <clears throat> Connie? Lead us in worship. Okay. Good morning. May the peace that comes from the gift of God's Son be with you in abundance and also with you. Today we join the generations of faithful believers in offering ourselves to God through the words of the psalmist. Today's reading is Psalm 71. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and rescue me. Incline your ear to me and save me. To me, the rock of refuge, to which I may continually come. The rock and my friends. For you, O Lord, are my hope, my trust, O Lord, from my youth, upon I have leaned from before my birth. You are the one who took me from my mother's womb. My mouth is filled with the grace, and I take glory all day. Do not cast me off in the time of old age. Forsake me for not when my strength is spent. I will hope continually and will praise you for yet more and more. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of the salvation all the day. I will also praise you with the harp for my faithfulness, O oh my God. I will sing praises to you with the lyre, O oh Holy One of Israel. My lips shall adore, my praise to you. My soul also, which you have redeemed. 
call to the affirmation of the Incarnation. The Word has become flesh and dwelt among us. Our God is not distant from us. Our God has embraced our weaknesses and shared in our sorrows. Let us then draw near to God's throne of grace with confidence to receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. You choose to do life with us so that we might choose to do life with you. So we choose the way of loving others rather than the way of hatred and strife. We choose the way of forgiveness rather than the way of bitterness. We choose the way of kindness rather than the way of indifference. We choose the way of faith that leads to the cross rather than the way of selfishness. We choose the way of remembering your faithfulness and mercy rather than forgetting that you are good. Thank you for choosing us and choosing us to life with us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Have a minute of silent, silent prayers and reflections. Amen. The miracle of God's love for us is shown to us in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was truly God, did not seek to remain equal with God, but instead gave up everything, becoming a slave when he became like one of us. God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Let's share with God's abundant life with each other as we greet this morning. Peace to you, Bob. Blessings. No uh, problem. Peace to you. You didn't think we need you, we did not need to accept the reports, is that right? Right. You because you proclaimed them. Yes. Yeah. I don't know that we need do we we don't need a motion to accept those, do we? Before I dismiss, I can do that, I suppose. You're singing, you'll get them seated, so.
What an amazing thought. Our lives are in the hands of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture. Words affirming to us just exactly what we mean to you. Forming us what you mean to us. Help us this day. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear hearts to understand that which you have for us as we open your word and speak from it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our text today is a text from John chapter 2, and it begins with these words. On the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there, and Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. And when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. 
Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. And Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. And when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you've kept the best wine, the good wine, until now. This is the first of his signs Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. The story is familiar, isn't it? As soon as I started reading, as soon as I said Cana in Galilee, you all automatically had that story, didn't you, in your mind. It's such a familiar story. It's kind of like the story of the prodigal son. You start with the, you know, here was this young son, and all of a sudden you can take your way all the way through the story. You kind of see what's going to unfold, right? Or the Good Samaritan, the moment, you know, there was this person alongside the road, and the priest, I'll say, I know where that's going. I know what's happening. Isn't that amazing how the power of story stays with us? You may not remember the exact words, but you do remember the story because our lives are built around those things that are what I call narratives. Our lives, our lives are more formed by what we understand and picture than by what, by what comes into our brain and informs us. So the writers of the gospel, they're interesting guys, interesting people. Now, I'm, I know I've shared this with you, but, but I want to reemphasize to you that the gospels, as we know them, weren't written until like 40 to 60 years after Jesus was on the earth. So, for instance, it would be like now somebody writing an account of World War II. Okay? Or somebody writing an account of the Vietnam War now. So the writers have heard the stories, the stories that have been told about Jesus. Everything in those days was passed on by oral tradition. People were not real literate. So the stories of Jesus found a home, and those stories were told. And it's amazing the accuracy of the stories as they came down through the years. But each of the writers of the gospel has a different way of understanding who Jesus is. And they tell the gospel story differently. So for instance, Matthew, after Jesus comes out of the wilderness, the first thing that Matthew has Jesus do is he ascends to a mountain and there he proclaims the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew wants us to see Jesus in light of who Moses is and a new decree coming from God. Mark has Jesus going and being baptized. And then Jesus immediately goes into the synagogue and he casts out a demon. Mark wants us to see that Jesus is involved in spiritual warfare and he is the one who has all power. Mark wants us to see something different. Luke tells us the first thing that Jesus did after being baptized is he goes to the synagogue and there he preaches and he preaches a text from Isaiah. It says that the Lord has sent him to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. He is the Jubilee. He is the Messiah. Each of them have a different story they're open with because they want to capture something with us. And John is no different. Jesus hasn't done a thing other than call his disciples. He's had his disciples, and he's gone, and he's gathered them, and they're coming. And the very first thing that John has us see is Jesus going to a wedding feast? But it's the specifics of that story which are captivating. Now, if we were just onlookers, 
to the story and we only took the information we're giving it's probably different than that story that you have in your mind because we have a tendency to inflate things and exaggerate things and to add things and and all of those other things the story is very brief actually think what you think about it the wedding we know from tradition takes place on a Wednesday night and the wedding is like a big event in the village life and the family life of the people getting married so it's a seven-day deal there are seven days of festivities around the wedding from the wedding on there's this amazing celebration tradition says that the parents of either the bride or the groom are Zebedee and Salome. Now you say, well, what does that have to do with it? Well, Salome, according to tradition, is Mary, Jesus' mother's sister. So she is a sister to the mother of one of the people getting married, which makes Jesus a cousin. Now I want you to know that in the tradition of things, to have a rabbi, who Jesus is a young rabbi gathering disciples around, to have a rabbi in the family attend the wedding feast is like, that's like off the charts. You know, that's, that's like having me come to your family gathering. You know, that would be like just an amazing experience, right? So this is something really important, and the rabbi is there, and Jesus is there, and we're pretty sure that it's connected through family. Now, here's the story. It's interesting. We're told that Mary comes to Jesus, and if you were watching the scene that's going on here, you would hear these words. They have no wine. That's all she says. They have no wine. And if you're watching the story, you're the little bird or the little mouse over in the corner or the little bird up on the branch, and you're watching this, you hear Jesus say these words from the original text. Woman, what to me? What to you? That's what he says to her. My hour has not come. Then the very next thing you would hear is Mary saying to the people gathered there, do whatever he says. How did we get there? There is no line. What to me? What to you? Woman, it's not my time. Do what he says. There are so many missing pieces to that, our imaginations can just go crazy with that. What all is going on? What's interesting is, if you were the little bird or the little mouse watching, you notice that there are six jars over there and they are for the ceremonial cleansing, the washing rituals, and they're empty. And then you hear Jesus say, fill the jars with water. That's all you hear. And you watch them and they fill the things to the very top with water. You don't see anything else. You don't hear anything else. And the next thing you hear is, take it to the steward. So you are take it to the take it to the one who's over the, the wedding. So you would be watching these servants take a dip from the container of water and taking it over to the one who's in charge of the wedding feast, who is there to make sure everything goes well. And you'd watch him drink. And you'd go, this is really curious at this point. Because there's just, there's nothing filled in. I wonder what that guy's going to do when he tastes that water. How does that fix no wine?
And if you were the little bird or the little mouse, all of a sudden you would see the wine steward taste it and go, Eureka! Everyone serves the best wine first so that when people get a little bit, you can serve the bad stuff and they're not going to know the difference. But you serve the best stuff last. If you're the little bird and the mouse over in the corner, you'd be going, that stuff, that was water in the jug, and how did we get to all of that? And then, John ends the story by saying this is the first of the signs, the first of the clues of who Jesus is, and that clue reveals his glory, and when his glory is revealed, the disciples believe. The story's amazing. Think about, I just told you what the story said, but think about all the stuff you've added to the story for it to kind of feel right. You filled in all the blanks. Jesus didn't take the, the water that they brought to him and go. <laughs> there, wasn't, there were no words spoken over it. He didn't lay hands on the jar. But the contents that was put in the ritual jars now become wine. Why would he do that? I want you to know that the fact that he did that caused great, great concern to the holiness group of people that I began my faith journey with. Because they insisted it was grape juice. And, you know, because, you know what, what would Jesus be doing otherwise? What were the implications of that? And so we didn't know what to, how to put that in there. So that was just a part, one of the stories we didn't read. We went on to other things because that's kind of how we all do things. We don't like to be shown things that are apart from where we are camped out in the faith. Let me point out some subtle nuances. We don't know why Mary shares the problem with Jesus. What would provoke Mary to come to Jesus with the problem anyway? She doesn't ask Jesus to do anything. There's nothing that suggests that she knows his power or that she's expecting a miracle. She just says they're out of wine. Now, I'm wondering, because in that culture, everyone who shows up at the wedding is supposed to bring some thing. You know, it's like you, you go over for a dinner at a friend's house and you show up with a bottle of wine. I'm wondering if Jesus and his disciples didn't, and therefore what they partook of made things short for everybody, and so Mary comes, I don't know. I'm imagining things in the story now. But why would Mary come to it? She's not asking him to fix it. She's just stating the problem. She simply tells Jesus the problem. And then Jesus refuses to act. Jesus hasn't taught yet. He hasn't done any miracle yet. He hasn't done anything but gather disciples. And he says to her, basically, I have different plans. My agenda is in the hands of God. My hour has not come contextually would imply that he understood that he was a bee about the kingdom and the fulfillment of the kingdom when God's fullness would come in and that hour had not yet come. The six ritual jars, it's interesting, 20 to 30 gallons each, they were used for washing hands or maybe washing feet. It's interesting because the idea that they're attached, the John is very specific in the text that they are ritual jars, and the whole idea of the cleansing has to do with the Jewish identity and provides order and structure to things. It was uniquely Jewish to 
wash, had the ritual washing. It meant that you were somehow separate from, apart from, those things unclean, including people. So you couldn't come in contact with the Gentile without then ritually washing yourself. You couldn't come into contact with someone who was sick or had some sort of a, a, a contagious condition. You would have to wash yourself. You couldn't come in contact with someone who was dead. You would have to wash yourself. So the ritual jars provide an identity for who God's people are, but it also provided a ritual that alienated and separated them from everyone else. And Jesus is constantly challenging ritual, particularly empty ritual. Think about it. The ritual containers filled with water become transformed into containers filled with wine that enhance the joy of everyone. That which previously was used to isolate and segregate of them versus us is now transformed into joy, exuberance, plenty, abundance for everyone. What Jesus does in turning water to wine is a vibrant picture of abundant celebration festive joy before God. But here's the amazing thing. The miracle is implied. Like I said, there's no outward demonstration. Nobody knows what's going on. Think about it. We are not told that Jesus turned the water to wine. Nowhere in the story does it say that. We just know that the water gets turned to wine. The water simply became wine in the story. The steward doesn't know where the wine comes from. The servants know where it came from. It came from the water that they put in the jars, but they don't know how the water becomes wine. And the guests are not even aware that there's a problem to begin with. Because the empty vat now has an abundance of wine. There is nothing that would publicly demonstrate anything miraculous. Each person knew a piece of it, but the disciples are watching it. And they see a sign, a clue that says this must be the Messiah. They watched the whole thing and they became convinced when they saw the end result that Jesus was the one promised to them. Do you know that Jesus in essence transformed water into about 60 cases of wine. Quite a party. It's lavish. It's liberal. It's generous. It's excessive. It is meant to show that when Messiah comes, God's goodness is more than we can contain. It is above and beyond anything that we can imagine. It is over the top. And yes, God doesn't mind when people celebrate. God doesn't mind when people are happy. God doesn't mind when people are experiencing joy and they're celebrating the things of life. That is not a stodgy God that we serve. It is a God who enjoys life and wants us to enjoy life. And enjoying life, it is over the top life. That's what John wants us to see. I think that's an important picture of God. Jesus isn't solving world hunger. He's not making world peace. He's not resolving the immigration issue. Rather, he's enhancing 
human celebration, fostering joy and festivity, ensuring that there's more than enough. That's the kind of Jesus we serve. This is the first clue as to who Jesus really is. The first thing we see that would prov provide a clue and allow us to see his glory. The Jews believed that when Messiah would come, that the grapevine, that each branch of the grapevine would have a thousand cluster of grapes. And each cluster of grapes would have a thousand grapes on the cluster. And each of those would make a thousand gallons of wine. That was the picture, the image, the story that they had. When Messiah comes, the joy that comes, which wine is always representative of, will be immense. And when the disciples saw that, they believed. I'll close with these words. On the mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a rich feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. And he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all of the earth, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, Behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that we might, he might save us. This is the Lord, we have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. When the disciples saw it, the rich aged wine in the midst of a feast, they said, this is the one we've waited for. And they believed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the words of Scripture, words that challenge us and move us, words that stir us. We thank you for these things as we receive them into our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.
join me in our profession of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, Bruce and Tom, if you would, we will receive our morning offering as Matt ministers to us. Kevin, would you be able to get Carrie and have her come up? <coughs> Let's pray for our offering. For all that you have given to us, for all you have done, we are most grateful. Receive our offerings of thanks and our hearts of love and devotion. Amen. It's now time to go before God in prayer. Um, within our tradition that we have, 
uh, we offer names silently uh, before the Lord if there are something that comes to us from um, uh, from you we would announce that to you uh, I do know that uh, our prayers need to be currently for June Riley um, as she is uh, moving closer to her passing and uh, being with Christ. Um, so uh, I, I am aware of that. I don't have any other red tickets today. What I'm going to ask you to do when we get to that part of the prayer, we're going to do, institute something a little bit different. As we do that, I, I would like you, um, as, as you're sitting there, uh, as you begin to name the names, I would like you to take your hands and, and form a bowl with that and place your names in that bowl and then together, as we do that, we will lift that up and raise those names up to God together. I, I want to add that action to it. It may be a little strange at first, but nobody's watching because we're all praying. And I think after a time, you will get a sense of this is, this is something going up. This is something that we are offering up to God. So I'm, I'm going to ask you and encourage you to do that. So let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you. Sometimes we, we think in, in, in terms of sacrifice, in terms of, of uh, giving ourselves. And those are things that you call us to. But it is good to be reminded every now and then of your extravagance. How you transform with abundance that you are in a God who does exceeding abundantly above everything we could ever ask for. So within that abundance, we offer our prayers to you. We pray, Father, for our world, for those who are struggling, those who have suffered loss. We lift up before you those who are hurting, those who are in poverty, those who are hungry, we place before you children who have separated from their parents, orphans. We bring before you those who are, are most at risk, those who are refugees, those who are widows, those who have no place to call home. We bring before you, Father, the cares of the world. We look to our world and we say, Lord God, heal. Bring your presence to that. We are especially mindful today of those who are close to us and dear to our life, those like June Riley. We hold them now in our hands and we silently bring their names and place them within the grasp of our hands. We raise these names up to you. We ask, Lord, that you would touch and heal, that you would restore and bring peace, that you would bring joy and comfort, that your grace and your mercy would surround these we have offered up before your throne. We thank you, Father, for our church family, for the churches in our community that call in the name of Christ. Help us, Lord, all to be the Christians, the face of Jesus, the witnesses of the resurrection that you've called us to be. Lord, we thank you for all of these things. We pray them in the name of Jesus who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever amen before we go to our last hymn i want kevin and carrie to come up if they would i asked kevin if that was okay by the way and he looked at me and said we'd love to <laughs> Well,
when we first met these folks, Keith Keaton was just a thought, <laughs> possibility, right? And we have watched them develop into a young family. They are looking to move and to relocate somehow in their personal lives, and with that will come relocating into another church family. And they have served us. Kevin has been an elder, and Carrie has been a deacon. They have served us in so many amazing ways. They brought refreshing and goodness to us, and so we want to send them off with our blessings. So would you kind of extend your hand this way, and we will pray over them as we send them off. Lord God, we are thankful for this couple, for their devotion to you, for their service, their hearts for the kingdom. We thank you for the gifts that they have brought to us and the time that they have been with us. We send them off now to those who they will now join and form new family with. And may they continue to be a blessing to them and may they who are joined to them serve them and be a blessing to them. Bless their lives as they move forward. Help them to see you and to see your will for their lives. And may their gifts and their talents be used for the kingdom of God. We love them. We thank you for allowing us to love them. And we know that you love them. And we send them now into that love in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You too. <laughs> Would you now stand and we will sing our final hymn. two things I got to do before I bless you, all right? One is I skipped an item on the report and we have to do this. So I would entertain a motion that you approve, you receive and approve all of the reports as they've been given to you. Is there a motion for that? Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you. All of you who are in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Perfect. I want to pray over our meal so that you can just go down and you don't have to wait for anything, so let's do that. Lord, thank you for the time of fellowship that we are about to uh, uh, partake of. Thank you for the food that's been provided, for the abundance that you give to us. Help us as we eat and share together. Enhance our fellowship and help us to know your goodness 
as we commune with your people in Jesus' name. Amen. With that said, let me bless you. May the Lord our God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. May today, within your heart, you know of God's abundance and his desire for your life to be full and to be rich. May you go in the peace of knowing God's love. Go in peace, for we are. Amen. Amen.